welcome to another episode of Control Alt Access. It's a video and audio accessibility in video games podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Laura. I'm here as ever this week with my lovely co-host, Arevia. Hi. We're doing our first recording from our new little recording slot. We're doing we're doing Sunday night recordings now, so it's a different vibe. You've you've come for for <laughs> late evening chill, Laura and Arevia now, as opposed to early in the morning. Oh, we're barely awake. Yeah. What's the news? <laughs> Last time was 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 something. Uh, so we are we are we are following <laughs> that trend of being tired. It's late. We but we are so ready to get this we're out. We're so ready. Yes. I've had a whole weekend to be like, <laughs> we got we got accessibility. We're gonna talk about it. It's gonna be great. It's gonna um, be great. <laughs> Uh, do you want to start us off this week by talking about stuff you have played? Yeah, so last time we talked, uh, I said that I was doing like a subathon, and that was done. I completed it. I completed Ocarina of Time. We actually were yeah, able to complete the whole thing. And oh my god, it has made me like miss old retro games and the, the <laughs> old genre. And like, I'm just so looking forward to see. Uh, I, I know it's like you, you shouldn't say this and you shouldn't ask for this, but I'm looking forward to more uh, like remakes um yeah, we, we I get it <laughs> yeah we, we talked a bit about like uh earlier we talked a bit about um you and me that there is not that much that happened these last couple of weeks gamescom is just over and like things are over we're just waiting for the next big things and like for yeah. me as well i'm just like <laughs> Oh, can I get some more? Can I get some of my childhood memories back, please? <laughs> can I can I get some news about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's there's a couple of remakes that like I'm surprised haven't been released yet. Like I know it's really a lot of people who like Nintendo games talk about these ones a lot. But yeah. On the Wii U, there were HD remakes of a couple of 3D Zelda games, Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. Yeah. And considering like 99% of first party games for the Wii U are now also on the Switch. Those two remakes have just been sat there, not announced, and people yep. are like, just, I could, I could play some old Zeldas. Yeah. Give me some shiny old Zeldas. But playing those games with a grown lady's mind, uh, an adult <laughs> mind, and seeing the text and seeing <laughs> like the context and this being 1990s Nintendo, I was just like, yeah, I think I might also understand why it haven't been remade because they couldn't say things that they blandly say in that game today. They, it's just, <laughs> I think yeah. a lot of things just like flew over our head when we were kids. But like, <laughs> yeah. I played it and there were so many clips of me going, they said what in that game? And it's just like that typical 1990s Japan. Uh, things were different, the times were different. And that is okay, it, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's surprising looking back at some of Nintendo's old uh, catalog. Like, yeah, one of the Nintendo remakes I hear people or re-releases I hear people talk about a lot is Mother Three, the sequel to what yes. was called Earthbound yes. in the UK and Europe. And people always go, "I have no idea why they haven't re-released it." And I'm like. Have you played Mother 3 yeah. recently? There's a lot of stuff in there that hasn't aged terribly no. well, or that at the very least I don't think Nintendo wants to grapple with. Yeah. Nintendo has firmed up their family-friendly image a lot over yes. the years, and a lot of yes. a lot of their past is interesting in hindsight. From going from a company that used to own like taxi companies, love hotel, yeah. and like playing cards up till <laughs> being the most family friendly like you whatever you mm. buy from nintendo ish you can give it to your kids and you're safe kind of i feel like that is some parents have that idea and mm. uh, yeah the change it, has been brutal <laughs> it would be like i i think the the, the example for non-gaming people is if you learned that disney a hundred yes. years ago ran love hotels yes it would be a bit of a surprise that that, that image yes. shift had happened yes yes but as a threat, uh, I have, um, I'm back at my daytime job. Uh, so mm -hmm. I had like a year of uh, leave, like unpaid leave to do mm -hmm. some, uh, some uh, to do a game accessibility. And yeah. then I realized, hey, uh, having a stable income is good. So I'm back yeah, at my, is. yeah, it is really. And now that like the industry is really, really hurting, I was just like, yeah. I, I want to go back to stable income and do still do this, but do it as part time. And then yeah. I, uh, so I have since that, since I'm like rotting away at an office doing accounting work, <laughs> <laughs> I needed something a bit more different. So I downloaded mm. or tried Ace Attorney for the first time. 
never okay. played it before. But as I said a million times, I have a love for Japan and stuff like that. So I was just like, no. maybe this have the humor, and it absolutely does. And oh <laughs> my god, I I cannot explain it for anybody who haven't played Ace Attorney's games. They are you are a uh, uh, oh what is it called lawyer? Uh, def- uh yeah, yeah, like a defense attorney defense specifically. Attorney. Like, yes, yeah, and you defend people who has done crimes mostly. At least the stories I've played so far murders and it's yeah. made like a visual novel and you just mm. click through things and but it is not just an attorney because yes you do things in a court system but you also do things like being a detective like things <laughs> attorneys yeah. don't do in real life but it's really really fun and it's nice just having what i figured out is that it, it's nice to have a game i only focus on the game I play it when yeah. I'm not necessarily at Discord, when I'm not doing anything else. I'm just focusing yeah. on the game, and that has been lovely. Uh, also figured out that this even more make me wish that uh, the Xbox adaptive controller had uh, like uh, mouse clicks, mm-hmm. because <laughs> I wish I could just play it with my feet. I wish I could just yeah. like fix everything with my feet, but like I can't do that with the setup that it yeah. is right now. So I'm just crossing my finger one day. One day Microsoft one day. give me what we want. But yeah, I I've had really, really fun. And I highly if you for me, uh coming into it uh in my age and haven't played any of the Ace Attorney games before, for me it feels like if a Yakuza side game, a mini game, met <laughs> Spy Family. In a visual novel. That is that is a beautiful way to describe yes. it. <laughs> it's like it's so it's just like the brilliance of wacky uh Japanese minigames in Yakuza meets wholesomeness of yeah. Spy Family. And it, it's perfect. It's it's the height of like completely exaggerated nonsensical. Yes. You have to be willing to like suspend your disbelief yeah, yeah, yeah. and go. Some of these bits of evidence are going to be stretching believability a little bit of it, but you just turn your brain off and enjoy the absolutely bonkers journey that's happening. Yeah. Um, while people very dramatically shout objection at each other. <laughs> and let's just say it has physics for days and nights <laughs> and weeks. Uh, just let, let, we should just ha- like end it on that. But I've also <laughs> lately been playing a game that I have been recommended to be playing for years, and that is mm. Outer Wilds. And, that and is you actually... went into this knowing nothing, nothing. about it, didn't and you? And I still don't know <laughs> nothing. I'm still like not done with the game, so I'm not going. There isn't going to be any spoilers here, but I wanted to talk mm. about the accessibility. So, yeah. uh, so uh, Outer Worlds for people who do not know, you are a, a like kind of a lizard person living on a planet with your lizard people, and you are the next one who is going to be an astronaut and go out to space. So you go out hmm. to space, and then you can go to the different planets around your solar system and test things out. And then you start that this is a convoluted story, and I'm just going to end hmm. it on that. It's a yeah. subnautica in space. All I'm going to say. It gives mm. me some not gun space vibes. Yes, it is. Here is a sort of open-ended playground to go and explore and find clues that require some interpretation and might be leading to answers in very different places. Yes. Go explore and piece together what's going on and what to do. Yeah. And it's an absolutely amazing game. And also, like, really uh, carefully, like, a lot of accessibility options when mm. it comes to options from the developers... I was actually mm-hmm. quite impressed. Like they have looked into a lot of things, like HUD size, which normally we see in in indie games. The HUD size is just forgotten. I was so mm-hmm. glad when I saw it. you could make like the the yeah. the HUD really really big, and there is a lot of these things like controller support. It has like you can change button remapping, a lot of like the menu and um, uh, music sliders. A lot of good things. I'm I'm starting mm-hmm. with that. So, uh, for most people, this game would be accessible. And for the listeners or watchers today who might not know, I have a brain injury. So I'm born with a brain injury called cerebral palsy, which is normally you get it the first year of you being <laughs> alive, but uh, you most of us get it when we have been born due to lack of oxygen, and that is my case. But it's a really, really mild case. But one of the things I struggle with is the cognitive aspecting around it. I can't deal with stress so well emotionally. Uh, Sometimes it can be hard for me to emotionally regulate me. I can get meltdowns, all of these things. And um, this today, I realized while streaming this game, 
that I struggled with these kinds of game because the lack of cognitive accessibility. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Because in this game, you have a logging system, but that logging system you can only access when you're inside your ship. And you're mostly, the only time you do mm-hmm. your ship is when you move from one place to another. Mm-hmm. And you aren't that often, like it takes like a half an hour between each time you, like in real life hour before you yeah. are in a ship again. And yeah. I struggled with that. And also the hint, there is no way for you. The, the, the game never tells you where to go next. You need to interpret mm. it to figure this out. And I got so frustrated today during stream that I, I actually like my viewer kind of just dropped because I think yeah. everybody saw that I was so frustrated because I just didn't understand. And I, yeah, yeah I, I grew up not knowing I had a brain injury. My parents were told by doctors to not tell me. So I just got like lost in this puddle of feeling like mm. that child again. It's so weird. But like, I felt like this, oh, like it, yeah. I'm in a world and I don't know what is happening, but everybody around me, because like chat, all, almost all of them had played it, understand it. And I just don't. And yeah. something is wrong, but I can't see it. And I yeah. got so flustered playing this game. And I had a really similar experience. You did? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, so, like, I want to talk about this. And I think that this game is a fascinating game. I think 100%. there is a lot of reasons to recommend it to people. I am going but I had to a similar... play it. I yeah. just need to change a bit on how I well, ask for help. <laughs> yeah. Because my here's the situation. I started playing it on stream as well. And I went in not knowing anything going in. And I tried to play it on stream. And I realized quickly. I had originally planned I was going to do the whole game on stream. I did one stream and was like, I want to keep playing, but I can't do it on stream. Yeah. Because I I couldn't have that relationship of I'm wandering around frustrated and struggling with how to progress in an environment where there are people who know what to do watching, who either will ignore my requests not to help and to let me just figure it out and will be like, well, I I, I just had to say something because it was so frustrating watching you not, n- not be able to work out what to do. Or... Even if they weren't being like that, just the knowledge of I'm going around in circles and I'm not making progress and I'm taking so long not making progress, I feel really self-conscious about it. I couldn't enjoy playing that game with people watching. No. Um, and I understand what you mean about the the note system uh, only being accessible uh, when you're in the ship. I did play through this game, but I ended up doing so. I initially had like a paper notebook where I was making my own notes so that I could reference them when I wasn't in the ship. And then I started just occasionally looking at walkthroughs and just going, I just need a bit of a pointer. And I'm glad I saw that game through to its end. But like, it requires such an amount of remembering really niche interpretable details you might not have seen for ages that you might not have had your attention drawn to. In a context, you're not expecting to see that information reapplied. There's a lot of cognitive load of... I have to realize that that thing I saw there fits into this thing I saw here that looks nothing like it. Yes. And, and that's a lot of really heavy cognitive work that I struggle yes. with. Yes. And I I always, I'm a champion for developers allowed to not add accessibility if that yeah. they mean that they will take away from what they want their experience of the game yeah. to be. I believe that. It is a sort of sucky truth that like you don't necessarily want like it, it's okay yeah. if you feel I can't play this game then, but I ho- wholeheartedly think that if they believe that it will take away too much, I mm. uh, that it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, it sucks, but it is okay. But where I, I in this game, I it sort of feels like that the developers don't know that there are other ways you can have done this. Because I talked to the chat mm. today, and one of the things we do talk about cognitive load. So you you drive your spaceship, which is ridiculously hard to drive. And <laughs> yes. part of the fun of it is that, like, that you have, like, um, added, um, like, you have to try and go back and back and back and back t- to the same planets over and over and over yeah. again. But then yeah. somebody in chat said something really, really well. Why didn't they add an upgrading system to your system, your spaceship, so that mm. when you are at the planet, say you have been there for X amount of times, you could find an upgrade that makes it so that your ship automatically brings you back. So then you don't yeah. need to do that. Like there are ways we could have find this in the middle or like you could have, yeah. like there are ways we could have figured this. Also things mm. like 
uh, I, uh, but I also heard from chat that the developers actually have changed a lot during the last five years and also after mm. the, uh, the DLC because a lot of people felt frustrated around the DLC. I haven't played yeah. that one yet. But so, Neither have I. so the developers have done a lot of changes upwards. So they seem willing. So what I wish to see from them, what I wish if I could, if I could get all my dreams <laughs> come true, <laughs> I would love to see one getting like an upgrading system in the form of like that, and two give a bit more help to us who don't necessarily learn so easy because that is something that when so many things is new in a game, I get cognitive fatigued and I can't yeah. process information as good as. A normal person would so yeah. like things like how when you look in the in the where like your log system is just explain because it took me a ridiculous amount of hours to understand that there was a difference between a uh, exclamation point and an asterisk and those things beside the names in your yeah. database meant something and these are the small things that i wish i i just wish i could like can i invite the developers on a cup of tea and maybe a lunch and we could just like talk together mm. because I think I I think they are on it. They just like they are so close to be able to make it more accessible for people like me. Yeah. But I think I wanted to give it at least one more stream because uh, what I actually realized, I am really, really sad to hear that you had that bad experience because I experienced the opposite. I experienced ah. today that everybody in chat, every time I got flustered, one People were just like, hey, I see you are getting actually really flustered because I'm actually getting flustered, flustered. Can I give you yeah. a hint that won't spoil anything, but like what you should maybe do next? So they just give me a small yeah. hint. And then also when I explained that this isn't because I just want, I have a brain injury. They were just like, hey, when you, can we just, can you start saying like, hey, chat, I need an actual hint. Now I don't know what to do. And then they gave yeah. me like itty bitty small hints. So they started working with me. So we sort of played it together. And I was just like, okay, if this is what I can ask from chat, then it will be fun. I'm really glad to hear that. And I think if I streamed this game today, I would probably have a better experience with yeah. it. I, I streamed this before I started doing accessibility stuff regularly in yeah. the space. And I, you know, occasionally talked about being disabled, but it was not a thing I talked about nearly as regularly. And I feel like having the feeling safe to talk about that, yes. I think definitely would have helped that experience. But yeah. I'm glad you had a positive one yeah. and that, it, that you are feeling up to going back to it. That is yeah. really good to hear. And I also learned today that I have some on untouch upon trauma against the growing up not understanding i have a brain injury and going through my early childhood not understanding why yeah. everybody around me understood thing i never seemed to understand and having all this problem that i this game has brought yeah. me to me like i might need to sit down and start doing some work on this because i did not think it would affect me this much and somebody in chat was just like how can you do work and stuff if you get so like not in a mean way but the gist was yeah. how can you do work and stuff if you get so flustered by not having control over things and i was just like Hey, maybe if I start working a bit mm. on this, I can have a better day and work through my trauma. So, hey, this game yeah. has given me so much. <laughs> not, not having control over things is a really great way to put it. Because yes. I, I know, like, I, I know that that is a particular kind of trauma that being disabled also gave oh, yeah. me. Hooray for compatible trauma. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, for me, it's I sometimes find with games if I'm streaming them where there will be people in chat who, before I've had a chance to like try and work something out, are already telling me what to do. Yeah. And I find that really hard. And that yes. was a thing that took me a long time to work out, like, what's at the core of that? And for me, it was growing up as a kid that so frequently didn't have control of aspects of my life with a disability that really needed some rigidity. Yeah and some control and like that that was a whole thing to work out yeah. and sometimes sometimes playing games in front of people makes you realize like ah, i got some i got some stuff to unpack I, I here have, huh? yeah i until friday in my next stream session i i need to maybe take and journal a bit or something i need to look into this <laughs> but laura what have you been playing this week uh, so I've been playing some stuff that's got some good accessibility that I'm excited to talk about, but I do want to talk about one I played today that yep. I've only just added to our little list, because hearing you talk about, uh, about, about, uh, Outer, Outer Worlds has made me remember that today I played through a remastered version of an old LucasArts point-and-click adventure game hey. called Full Throttle. Um, and this is one of the last LucasArts point-and-clicks that they made. It is a point-and-click adventure game about a member of a biker gang 
who is trying to stop this uh, the last company on earth making motorcycles from being sold to some company that will turn it into a minivan company and uh, trying to clear his name for being framed for murder. Um, it's not a hugely long game. The narrative's really fun. It's uh, it's a very funny and sweet game. Yep. I like a lot of its presentation. But I got really frustrated playing it, and I want to talk about some of the yep. reasons why I found it really, uh, really difficult from a cognitive perspective. Um, the game has several things about the way it presents its its UI that are really inconsistent in ways that made the game really hard for me to play. Um, generally speaking, like a lot of point-and-click adventure games, when you mouse over something that is interactable, your icon will change. In this case, it becomes a little crosshairs with a, a box around it. Mm -hmm. And that tells you, like, you can click on that thing, you can interact with it, you can decide whether to, like, use an inventory item or to um, touch it or yep. look at it or whatever. Sometimes there are things in the game that are vital for you to click on that don't bring up that interact no. prompt. Um, and some examples of this are you have to go hide behind that um that that object over there and that's a an interactable it's not part of the background you can click on it and you have to click on it to hide behind it but it doesn't bring up an icon no. or um you have to sort of walk across this this location um and sometimes it'll be cuz i'd sort of like internalized after a while that the rule was Sometimes you'll have to interact with things by walking somewhere. Yeah. And if that's the case, it won't bring up the crosshairs. So if it brings up the crosshairs, you're, like, using an item on it, you're not walking there. Like, this is the select how to interact with it uh, icon. Except sometimes that's the other way around. Sometimes you have to click, even though there's the thing that's not for walking, and oh. it'll walk regardless. And that created some really, like, really frustrating, stressful yes. uh, points of the rules are unclear of what I interact yeah. with. And when you layer that on top of sometimes time limits of, like, you have a limited amount of time to find what you're supposed to be interacting with, and if you fail to find the thing in time, you have to replay a lengthy, unskippable oh. cutscene. And all of that came together to really, really taint what was otherwise a really lovely, positive experience. Yeah. Like, I think the game was well worth playing, but it was well worth playing with the caveat of, I'm so glad that my wife, who's played this before, was sat next to me and can go, I can see why you're confused by this and why you're frustrated. Here's, I'm just going to tell you, here's what you need to click on. I know that it, the UI isn't telling, giving you any hint at that. Yeah. Just, I will tell you this one because it's, it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. And I was like, thank you for co-piloting. I would have had a... I would have had a bad time with it otherwise. Yeah. Um, it, so, yeah. It, it gives me, it reminds me of like, hey, if anybody out there sometimes struggles and they feel like they are the problem, just know that not every game is, like, games are just made by humans and they are often yeah. made by, the design of things like that is made by one or a sm really, really small team of humans. And they would just look at the way they interpret something. Yeah. and those don't always match up to everybody, and that is okay. Yes. Indeed. Um, but on a more positive one, I want to talk about a really lovely thing I played this week that has a lot of positives to say about it with accessibility, but a couple of unfortunate negatives, and we'll get to those. But uh, I played Astrobot! Yay! The new PS5 Astrobot game! Uh, uh. <laughs> I got it sent from PlayStation as well, and I can't wait to play it. It looks so cute! I I had such a good time with it. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what this game is, um, the PS5, when you buy it, comes with a digital uh, pack-in game called Astro's Playroom, and it's maybe like four or five hours long, and it's a 3D platformer where you play this cute little robot running around these environments, trying to find hidden robots hidden in the environment, trying to find little puzzle pieces, and just exploring these like very intricate little uh, collect-a-thon dioramas. Um, Astrobot is what if we made a 20-hour game out of that? What if we just did a bigger one of those? Um, and it's charming, and it's... I don't know the last time I played a 3D platformer that was this consistently good start to finish in terms of, like, overall quality. Yeah. There was never, like, a moment that felt like filler in the whole thing. It yeah. was delightful. Uh, just talking generally about some of the nice things about it, it is a really lovely love letter to, like, the history of... Not just PlayStation-owned characters from over the years, 
but characters that you associate with being PlayStation, yeah. even if they're not strictly PlayStation. Yes. Like, the not too spoilery example I give is Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk oh. is a character that, like, you can have Tony Hawk games on other consoles, but when you think of Tony Hawk, you probably think old PlayStation yeah, games. Yeah, you do, 100%. And, you know, as you're going around these levels, you'll collect little robots and you might find one dressed up like Tony Hawk, for example. Oh. It's a, It does a lot of, like celebrating those bits of PlayStation history that are like, you know, they're other people's games, but like, you think of them when you think yeah. of PlayStation. Yeah. Um, so accessibility wise, some things I want to talk about, cause there's some, there's some pros and there's some, some cons. Um, Astro's Playroom, the, the, the shorter pack in title had a couple of accessibility barriers that made it unplayable. If you were just using an access controller on PlayStation and not also using a dual sense controller. Yeah. Um, most importantly, there were mandatory motion controls that you had to use, mm -hmm. and there were mandatory touchpad inputs that you had to use. I can thankfully say neither of those is a problem now That's in, Astro, in Astro Bot. Um, touchpad inputs just don't turn up at all. You never have to think about those. Motion controls have been replaced with left analog stick inputs. Um, so you can just move the analog stick to mimic the motion that you would otherwise be doing. Yeah. I think that's great. I've really been brilliant. saying for years, PlayStation and Nintendo need to do this more often. Just let people use a stick to, as if it's the motion. But Laura, um, how can you force people into do the new cool thing that your system came with? <laughs> uh, some people, even if you force them, just can't do that thing. <gasps> All right. Give them an alternative. All right. oh. um, yeah, uh, and specifically on that motion control being able to be done with the analog stick, I want to talk about like one specific example that I think shows that they really thought through their accessibility design. Um, there is a level in which you need to both be doing motion and moving Astro as a character at the same time. Um, you are tilting some platforms to make water go a certain direction and also running around those platforms as Astro. The left analog stick is both doing motion and moving Astro, and they designed the level so that Astro never needs to move in a different direction to the motion. So... You, you never the 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 left stick moving astro say to the right will always be also the direction you needed to be tilting the motion oh. so that like you you can have both motion and character movement on one stick and the puzzles designed so it will still work hey that's really cool and yeah like that's a good example of like you thought through the practicality of how this would work good accessibility design yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's a couple of other bits of of settings stuff they've done. Um, you can uh, do some some camera stuff without having to use the right analog stick. You can press the circle button to recenter the camera behind you, or you can hold down the circle button to turn your left stick into the right stick. So the left stick does camera control, uh, which is really nice because it means if you're playing with an access controller with just one stick, you can hold down a button. Your one stick now changes the camera, let go, you're back to moving the character. And I'm like, that's a pretty good way of doing it. Yeah. Um, the other things you can do to make this game accessible settings wise are unfortunately not in the game. Some of them you have to do system level tweaks, yep. which is unfortunate. Yep. Um, the, this game does a lot with um, the adaptive triggers, the triggers that can be become harder to push in certain situations on the controller, the very fancy rumble that admittedly is very impressive you can feel like ah my robot's running on top of different materials or oh there's rain falling on my mm -hmm. controller uh and sounds coming out the the controller speakers none of those can be tweaked in game you have to go to your system settings to tweak them which yeah. is unfortunate but not not a hard uh, hard barrier no yeah um there is one new barrier introduced for access controller users that's important to talk about um it's not a hard barrier in that it won't prevent you seeing the credits at the end of the game, but it is a soft barrier that might prevent you getting a handful of collectibles. Um, there are mandatory moments in this game that require you to blow like an extended length breath into the DualSense controller's microphone. What? Um, yeah. Like, it'll be like, oh, I'm trying to t uh, blow out a candle, yeah, yeah. for example, and you have to just... Whoosh, yeah into the controller and there's no option to avoid that oh and it will never stop you getting to the end of a level but i would i would estimate off the top of my head there's maybe five to ten collectibles in the game that you might not be able to get if you can't do that it... and it's unfortunate because they clearly thought about the dual sense accessibility barriers in astro's playroom 
and then just introduced another without thinking about the fact they'd done it. Yeah. Okay. Like just like this almost just sounds like it's just like a mishap, sort of. Like if yeah. if part of it is so accessible and then like all almost the same, they haven't like it's just been forgotten more like like. What? I, I I don't know if it's that or even just that it just didn't occur. Yeah, to someone. yeah, like um, like that. It just didn't occur. Yeah. Like it was just like, yeah, and, yeah. I would like to hope that people talking about it would mean that like I I have faith that this team might be willing to go back in and make an an option to pause and skip that that or to auto complete those interactions or yeah. something. It it doesn't seem like it would be a big accessibility ask to make, and it would. It would be the one thing that would make this playable with an access controller without having to use a dual sense, and that would be really nice. Um, uh, it's just like you could literally just have a button press. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that that being said, I do think this game is charming and yeah. adorable. Um, the way I've been talking about it this past week is like, I don't know that. I don't know that there's ever been an example of a not Nintendo made third person like three D platformer that has felt this close to like Nintendo's quality yeah. than this. I think this is the closest I've seen to another company managing to have that Nintendo level of this is just excellent start to finish. It is a incredibly polished, incredibly tightly designed game, and I'm so glad it exists. I really hope PlayStation funds more of more of these getting made. It's it, it's one tiny thing and a couple of settings I wish you could do in game rather than yeah. system settings. I'm glad that it's at least not hard barriers anymore. Yeah. Um so yeah, Astrobot, I it's fun. It's so fun. I can't wait to try it. I can't wait. Um there's a couple of other things I've played. I, I'm I'll I might save some of them for another for another week. Um I have been playing, I can talk about this now, I've been playing the finished version of What the Car, yeah. which uh, is a game I talked about a while ago I played the demo of. It is a very silly game about, you are a car with human legs, go, do little objectives, uh, every few minutes here's something new to be doing, <laughs> very chaotic. Um, it's so silly. Yeah. Having played the full game through now, it is exactly like my reviews of What the Bat and What the... Uh, what the golf it is i'm impressed at this development team's ability to have a hundreds of different very silly ideas don't get too married to any of them two or three minutes later okay we did that one here's something, here's new. something new yeah it it's it's the same feeling i got playing mario <laughs> wonder last year yeah where it's like you came up with such an interesting unique mechanic and you were willing to throw it away two minutes later for something else yeah and i'm like I, I respect that sheer amount of creativity. Yeah, um, this seems like we want to do something and we don't care about you yeah. think what you think about it. We're just going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I like that um, from an accessibility perspective. I like that the challenge is always in optional collectibles, optional high score chasing and optional hard levels off the beaten path. Completing individual levels is generally not that much of a progression barrier. That's it is... Good. It's like, hey, we want you to be able to finish the level and see the silly thing and get to move on and see the next thing. We're not trying to stop you progressing. Fundamentally, there's a collectible card you can try and get that might be a bit tricky in each level. You can try and do the level fast so you get a little gold crown. But as long as you get over that finish line one way or another, here's more content. Yeah. And I like that approach. I think it is I think it is a nice way of of something that is designed to just be silly bite-sized nonsense i'm glad that it's not trying to put roadblocks in front of you and stop you getting to see the fun yeah so yeah other than that uh one other one i'll talk about quickly i've been playing a very silly game that came to switch recently called peglin <laughs> this is a uh have you ever played peggle no i haven't so peggle is a game in which there's a bunch of little dots on screen and you can fire a ball that will bounce yeah, around on these pegs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. For anyone who's not seen it, uh, you, you're trying to hit all these pegs, and then you get a little high score and dramatic music plays. Yeah. Peglin is... What if Peggle was an RPG? Yes. What if Peggle was your battle system? Um, You fire your balls, and you're trying to hit different kinds of pegs that will deal different kinds of damage. Um, 
you collect different kinds of balls. Uh, it's kind of like a deck building yeah. game in that at the end of most stages, you get a, an option of like, do you want to level this ball in your collection up or get a new one? Or uh, how do you want to sort of augment the, the ones you've got? And they apply different statuses that require you to do different things. And you're ultimately just trying to fire this little ball and make it ping around the screen as much as you can to make your little goblin do damage to enemies. <laughs> um, how Can I it, ask how it is on mm. line, the color of line accessibility? Hey everyone, editing Laura here to give a quick update on Peglin because I was just completely wrong with my answer that I gave to Erevia about uh, colorblind accessibility. In the editing suite, I've looked at footage and gone, okay, yeah, I see what the answer is. Um, Peglin does have stuff to accommodate for uh, colorblindness, specifically um, icons are used on pegs to denote their function. The peg that is green that resets the peg field and refills it uh, has a sort of R for refresh on it. Uh, the ones that give you coins have a little circular icon sort of denoting a coin. Um, the ones that are yellow and activate special abilities have an exclamation mark on them. Basically, icons are used in place of colour for colourblind players. Um, I just completely did not remember the answer to this question and did not answer it correctly on the show, so, uh, you get to see, you get to see what, what, what I look like when I'm editing and in editor mode with my hair back, so we'll, we'll get back to the show. You're gonna you're gonna see editor Laura at least once more this episode because uh, uh, spoilers PS5 Pro got announced and I will acknowledge that when relevant. <laughs> it's been it's been a nice play it in little batches, not have to think too hard. There's so much randomness in it that I can't. I'm not gonna stress if I lose at it because it's a ball pinging around a screen. How much control did I ever have? Yeah. Um. But that's let it be my not have to think about things too much game yeah. recently, which has been nice. I see that it actually is on mobile phone as well. And I was thinking mm. when you said it, I was just like, this actually, I should get this on my phone. It's just it's, a silly uh, taking the bus to and from work. It's yeah. been really good for like that, that not, I don't have a huge amount of time and I don't want to get invested in something. I just want to ping, 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 things bounce around <laughs> the screen. I get a bit of dopamine. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's brilliant yeah. yes that makes sense um, so yeah with that said uh we've not got a lot of it this week but shall we talk about some news yes <laughs> on this week's news concord removes the sale uh, after only two weeks proteus refunds slash replace game comms unit yeah, so there's not a huge amount of news this no. week. We kind of hinted at that up top of the episode. Yeah. Um, and before we jump into these news, I like the we just had Gamescom, which is where yeah. a lot of stuff happened, and we think there might be a very busy news week next week. Yes. Because um when this episode comes out, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's um it might have already happened by the time this episode goes out. We're recording this on Sunday, the 8th of September. Yeah. Um, there are rumours that on, I believe, like, the 9th, 10th, maybe even 11th, uh, this stuff is going to start breaking. But it seems like... It seems pretty likely that a PlayStation 5 Pro is imminently about to be announced and revealed. Um, there was a leaked image sort of showing what it would look like. And then a couple of days later, PlayStation had a silhouette that looked just like the leaked image. Yeah in one of their 30th anniversary images so like that's probably happening and there's rumors of some switch 2 stuff happening yes. in the next like week or so so like we will have busy news yeah but we got we got a quiet one this yeah week. calm before the storm we are calm before Ex the storm <laughs> exactly um hi everyone editing laura again much as we expected, uh, the PS5 Pro has now been announced. Uh, it's £700 without a disc drive or a stand. Uh, but yeah, as we expected, between recording and editing this episode, it has been announced. Uh, but I still think uh, hypothesizing about what accessibility things you could see on a PS5 Pro is still an important discussion because they haven't talked at all about if there'll be anything different accessibility-wise. So I don't think this discussion is out of place, but I'm just going, yes, we know, the PS5 Pro did get announced. So let's let's talk about the first one. Yep. Um, PlayStation's uh, team-based hero shooter, Concord, 
has been removed from sale after just two weeks. Yep. They... Um, Everybody gets yeah. a refund. Even if you bought a physical copy, you can deliver it back yeah. and get your money back. And wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. In in literally since we last recorded to this recording, the game released, was announced to be cancelled, and went offline. Yeah. In the gap between episodes. Um I'm not surprised necessarily no. by the news given some of the stuff that's come out around it. Um Allegedly, it sold fewer than 25,000 copies total between PlayStation and PC, which is not a lot for a game that you're hoping to have a online community playing it regularly. Yeah. Um, and I think for us, the reason this is a disappointing story to hear is that we talked about Concord when it had its beta like a month ago. Mm -hmm. That game had some really interesting accessibility stuff going really on. Really um, good. Like, it was it, one of the first one we've seen in this genre doing these kinds of things yeah like uh we showed footage and if you're watching the video version there'll be footage up now you could make the ui in concord really big you could make the map the health bar the team point scoring all of them really large like impressively large um you could have a high contrast mode implementation where you could get high contrast outlines around characters that were color coded by team that were customizable um those were both really nice things to see, and it's a real shame to see yeah. one of the few hero shooters in its genre uh, that was doing this kind of stuff not be around. Um, yeah, it is sad, and also it, it's really sad for people who finally could play a hero shooter, yeah. now it just got ripped away. Because uh, anyways, there, there are people playing it and having fun with it, even though yeah. the sale wasn't as good. But yeah, I think actually Radders said it on Twitter yeah. really, really well. Um, she said that uh, Concord didn't fail for being woke. Concord failed for being uh, a game eight years in development, releasing about five years after people got tired of this game. You have to be yeah. something special to be worthy of playing uh, for in this genre. And then somebody underneath yeah. her tweet said, and it also the fact that it was full price, when a lot of games yeah. in this genre are for free. And yes, the... <sighs> no matter no. how much I love accessibility, for full price, that ain't for most people. That ain't a good enough pull. Yeah, yeah. It's it, yeah. The people who were trying to sell this as this game didn't do well because it had some characters who weren't white and a couple of characters had non-standard pronouns on the character select screen. I think those people uh, are being ridiculous. Uh, this is yeah. this is a game that launched into an incredibly crowded market and didn't have. A unique selling point really yeah it, it 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 is in a genre where um like i i don't think it's unfair to describe what this game was as being like it's a hero shooter it, it sort of is a hero shooter it, the character's vibe is kind of guardians of the galaxy but like what if we had guardians of the galaxy at home yeah and like i can't point to it and say this is that one mechanic that makes this different um, and I also don't think it helped that it released right around the time that um, Valve's big hero shooter, Deadlock, started being sent to a lot more people and a lot more people started getting access to be playing this excite this one that's like, oh, it's a hero shooter, but it also it's kind of like a MOBA. And yeah. like, like that had a selling point. People could go, it's like this genre mixed with this. That was a bad recipe for people. And that was free to play. Yeah. Versus that's this thing. one doesn't really have a selling point. And it's money. <laughs> and and no matter like this game or not, like the one thing I think is really, really sad is that this is going to go down once again in the books of developers go or studios most likely go. Mm. This is why we have microtransactions. <sighs> yeah. Sadly. Uh, yeah. It is a proof. And sadly, like no matter which like um, ethics or morals you have around that, if you like have a really strong opinion, uh, people mm -hmm. are do not have that much um, power in their money anymore. Like they don't have yeah. their power. Does, their money doesn't stretch as far as it did before. So free games when all of your friends, because a game like this, you can't just, uh, I can't remember what it was, but say it's $60. It's not just $60 because you're all your mates and friends also yeah. need to play it. So yeah. it's maybe $200, $300 for your whole group to get I, it. And I then, really... Yeah. yeah when you then can have a free game it sucks and i think it's yeah. so sad because then it takes down with 
the accessibility. But hey, I am thinking, can we get a No Mind's Sky? Yeah, they the developers have said like they they don't want this to be the end of Concord. They want to yes. like take it down so they can have a serious think about what needs to be done with it. Try and bring it back in a form that people are going to get excited about. And I hope that we get a No Man's Sky, a Final Fantasy fourteen, a Realm Reborn, yes. one of those stories of rising from the grave and being like really well received. Yep, the Phoenix but, has been yeah. born from the ashes before. We have seen it happen before. Yeah. But <laughs> as you as you say the. The thing is, as someone who really struggles with, um, I really struggle with impulsivity with microtransactions, and I avoid a lot of yep. games with heavy microtransaction use. For me, being able to just pay a one-off price and play a game in this genre and not have to have the claw yep. of microtransactions lingering, that makes a game more accessible for me. And I think, I honestly think the path for, forward for this game is going to be for it to go free to play. And I hope that that team is able to bring that game back and that it becomes popular but it won't be a game that i can play anymore and nope. i have to just kind of be okay with that yeah it is sad though and it, it yeah. comes again to what i've said each and every single episode nothing is zero percent accessible and nothing is a hundred percent accessible and uh, yeah yeah but i it's bad though i i, I feel really really bad for playstation mm. for getting this i feel really really bad for the developer team people have been really yeah. mean as sadly they always are but uh, i hope uh this will just be yeah it it also shows that you can't just make a game in a vacuum it's never ever yes. okay to be mean to anyone that mm. is like that is the the worst part of this industry period but also yeah. that if you want to sell a lot of copies you need to make something that especially is the one thing if this was a small indie studio kind of deal that wanted to like didn't have it but it was it was meant to sell as one of the biggest one that was what yeah. they like it is from a studio it, who only make things to sell to the for the big box so it's yeah yeah it, the the hero shooter space is currently having its version of the gold rush of people trying to make world of warcraft competitors yes. and Inevitably, people only have so much time available in their lives to play games that demand infinite amounts of time. Yeah. And not every game in that genre can be a success because eventually one of them will be the one that people don't have the time for. Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate, but it happens. Yeah, maybe if this game came out like during COVID, uh, when yeah. the economy, well, still were a bit stronger, people had a bit more money and people were inside all the time. Maybe this would be the next big thing, but yeah, games aren't born and played in vacuums. They are part of our social circle. Circle, so yeah, yeah sadly. Um, and we got one other bit of news this week, which Yay! I can talk a little bit about. Um, so last time we did an episode, uh, I'd just gotten back from Gamescom and I had purchased a Proteus controller at Gamescom, uh, which was really exciting. We talked a lot about the Proteus controller. Yeah. On the most recent episode, it is that accessibility controller made by plugging a bunch of cubes together. And I talked a little bit, and I kind of didn't go into huge detail on it, but I talked a little bit about the fact that I was disappointed that uh, the the version of the Proteus controller I'd bought at Gamescom that had been described to me by the person who sold it as a dev kit yep. uh, had technical issues with it which I hadn't been told about before buying it at full price. Um, and to talk a little bit more about those now that I understand a bit more clearly what they were and now that there's an update on it, um, there are a couple of problems with that version that was sold. Um, the power cubes that sort of do the data transmission and store the power um, don't power on if connected to... Uh, it's intermittent, but it seems to be either the left joystick or either of the trigger and bumper buttons. Hmm. If they're plugged in somewhere on your configuration, the power cube won't turn on. Yep. And Proteus had hoped that this would be a software solution that they could like do a firmware update and it would fix things. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that's not the case. Yep. Um, there is a workaround, uh, and it's not ideal, but the workaround is if you have the charging port connected to your controller, if you plug in a power cable, you can turn the controller on with the with the button, regardless yep. of what cubes are connected, and then unplug the power cable. Um, so you don't necessarily have to dismantle the controller to turn it on. You just plug a cable in. 
But Proteus did reach out, and they did reach out to everyone who uh, purchased one at uh, Gamescom um, to basically say, hey, this is the situation. We're going to let you keep the one that you bought at Gamescom. There's no pressure for you to return it. It does work with these caveats of either you're going to have to take a component off, turn it on, put the component on, or plug the power cable in, turn it on, take the power cable off. Um, but we will let you keep it, and then in October when the the the, the finalized retail um, units ship, we will send you another one. We will yes. send you one that is fixed, but you can also keep your existing one, which would mean, hey, having a second power cube, having a sec uh, an extra set of power cubes, an extra dongle, yeah. um, extra buttons to work with, um, which I think is like a nice solution. Yeah. Um, They've also been open to being like, hey, if it works better for you, a refund is an option. Um, and I'm yeah. glad that they they did this. Like yes. for a con we we talked about this the other week when I was having issues with the controller, and you were like, you talked about hoping that their customer service would be good at the price yeah. that they're at. Yeah. This feels like a positive sign for their customer service that they're like, keep the existing one. We'll send you another. We're very sorry about it. Yeah, and I am impressed. I. <laughs> In this industry, it is hard to sort of like admit when something goes bad. It's yeah. just hard, it, and I feel like they did a good here. They heard what people said and were like, "This, uh, we didn't feel that this was the most okay thing to do." And then yeah. they heard and say, "Hey, you had a really, really good point. Here is how we can fix it." And hey, yeah. kudos to them. Um, I have like I have worked with them promote yeah. the protest controller. I think it's really important to say that before. But yeah. outside of that, I am really impressed with that. I feel like they are taking this really, really serious. And I'm still just really looking forward to see it. This just made me happy yeah. when you told it to me. I was just like, yeah, yeah. this is the um, image I have I have had from them from before. And it's glad to see that it's keep getting updated. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm glad. It, something that is this expensive needs to have uh excellent customer service that is just yeah, how it is th that's the thing i when i have first heard from them i did quietly wonder i was like is it because i'm on a show like this and i talked about it that they reached out and like no to their credit they have done this for everyone and i think i think they found the best solution they could have done which yeah. was for now there is a workaround you can still you still have this controller you don't have to not have this controller that you're you excitedly have if yeah. you're happy to work around the the bugs with it we will just get you a working one as soon as we can. Yeah. Like, I was like, okay, that is about the best solution you could have to that problem. It sucks that it happened. I'm glad that you are taking it seriously. Yeah. Um, the other thing of note that they did say since uh, last recording is apparently it should not have been described to me as a dev kit. Yeah. Um, it was not intended to be framed that way. It was supposed to just be sold as it is a Proteus controller. Um, I can only use the words that I was told when I bought it, but yeah. I I did say to them, I was like, I'm happy to 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 say that, that you know to update people on that. Yeah. Um, it was not a case of they were selling it knowing it had. At least the way they're they're presenting it to me is they weren't selling it knowing it had irreversible problems. They sold it over the course of the day, started to learn it had problems, thought they could fix them, realized they couldn't fix them. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of a different situation. Yeah. And it do happen. And I'm glad to see that they're taking accountability and yeah, can't wait to yeah. test it out again. Uh, yeah, very quickly, I have been using the Proteus as my default uh, yeah. Xbox controller whenever I have the, the option to. And Oh, it's so nice. Ah, it's so nice. I can't my, wait. I've really fallen into a routine with it. Um, I, I found, like, I'm still, I'm excited for October because when my, my, the one that I had ordered before I picked one up at Gamescom, when that shows up, I will have two, and uh, two dongles yeah. and I'll be able to do split handed controls. I'm so excited for that. But even without that, the size, the shape, the being able to have like a 45 degree angle in the middle of my, my hold, having been able to move my bumpers and triggers. It's really quickly become how I want to be playing. Yeah. And I've fallen, I've really fallen into using this controller. It's so nice. I, I'm such a fan of this controller. I'm so Any envious. problems aside, I love it. 
<laughs> so good. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, can't wait to play with it more. Uh, so yeah, I think that's everything for news for this week. Yes. It. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, do we want to read a bit of feedback from last week's episode? Yes, last week our uh, unhinged episode, <laughs> not <laughs> episode, <laughs> no, but we asked like uh, a bit a prompt in the end, like, what was the accessibility tool you were looking forward to? And yeah. then Moon Whispers on YouTube said, my optimal controller right now would be a DualShock 4 style controller split in two, that is lightweight, had a turbo function like 8-bit uh, Pro 2, but has none of the vibration feature at all and works on a PC, because playing my Switch or PS5 is just too much work. The Joy-Cons are just too small, laid out poorly for me and non-ergonomic. So right now I just uh, stuck with keeping my DualShock 4 co uh, collection functional, as it's still the least taxing controller I have. Even the 8-bit Do Pro 2 is just too heavy, it's barely more than a, a DS4, but it makes a huge difference and I just but I can't just do it, use it for long. And that's, yeah, it's a good feedback. Mm. I, I, I feel like, like, this is something we also talked about, like getting a split control. Yeah. I want the joystick for everything. Yeah. Um, I... Controller weight is something that we don't talk about enough with uh, controller comfort. The, the wrist pain and and uh, exhaustion that can come from a controller being too heavy is a real barrier yep. for a lot of people to play a lot of the time. And as much as I love controllers with like more and more fancy features, I would love if every like one of the major console manufacturers were like, here is an official controller that we just stripped out some of the functions to make it lighter if you need that. Yes. One of that the would things, be a really cool option. Yeah, a lot of things when I play games, I either put the controller on my lap or on my mm -hmm. desk so I can lay it flat and then use, like, instead of using my thumbs for the uh, joysticks, I use my fingers, um, my point fingers, because, like, it's just too hard to hold it up for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I get it. I think it's a good, uh, a good um, call. Yeah, but yeah. Laura, if anybody wants to send us a message or want to get their uh, comments shouted out, where can they send it to us? Uh, you can leave a comment on the YouTube video for the new episode or the SoundCloud page for a new episode. You can send an email to controlaltaccesspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can send a message to either of us on social media. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am at Laura K. Buzz, and uh, Arevia is at Arevia on all of them other than TikTok. We'll yeah. address that at the end. Um, you could tell us some feedback, maybe, about our question for this week. Um, at the time we record this, the PS5 Pro hasn't officially been announced yet, and the Switch 2 hasn't been either. One or either of those might have changed by the time this episode comes out, but... I, even if they have, I doubt we'll have heard much accessibility information about them. So the question is, what would be your dream accessibility announcement for these new upcoming consoles? Yes. Ah, uh, I I can't wait. I can't wait, especially the Switch too. Ah, uh, uh. I I'm I'm I love the Switch. I love it so much. I'm just ready for a Switch that I think can live for another seven years. Yep. That, that, that isn't going... I'm excited to have a Switch that I don't have to hold my breath and go, if I give you a game that's a bit too difficult, are you going to heat up and I'm going to get concerned for your health? Yeah. I I, I just... I, I don't need it to be that different. I just want Switch but new. I, I That'd be enough for yeah. me, but I'm curious. It's a Nintendo. They'll probably do something weird with it. Yeah. I... Oh, I, I yeah. I, I can't. Like, on one side, I just want the standards. And on the other side, I was just want to see the wildness because maybe that can bring with it some accessibility. So I'm just, like, living in this limbo of I don't know what I want, but, oh, my God, I can't wait to see what is happening. N Nintendo is always a wild card. Like, yes. I never know what to expect out of Nintendo, and that <laughs> is half the fun. It, yes. might be, it might be amazing. It might be an accessibility nightmare. But I can't predict it, and that's... Too many companies in the games industry are predictable. Give yeah. me some some wild card energy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's been wonderful. But it's been absolutely lovely recording with you today, Laura. What are you doing at the moment and where can people find you? 
Uh, you can find me on the internet at Laura K Buzz pretty much everywhere. Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, that's the one that pays the bills. Blue Sky, Mastodon, find me at Laura K Buzz pretty much everywhere. Yep. Um, I have recently had online an episode of Accessibility that spends about 20 minutes digging into Astrobot. Um, I made a video about um, a bunch of quotes that A.G. Al Numa gave back in 2016 about what it would take for us to get Zelda as a playable character in the Zelda series, and the ways that, like, that lens has been colouring how I feel about uh, Echoes of Wisdom as it approaches release, and trying to, just trying to unpack some of those feelings, uh, so that is a piece you can find up on, on YouTube at Laura K. Buzz. Uh, if you go to laurakbuzz.com, I also wrote a piece this week that I was pretty happy with that was about um, how difficult it can be sometimes to to be excited about things, particularly when yeah. your job is to pay attention to the news around the things you love and how they're created. Yeah. Um, it sort of spawned out of this week um, the news of Linkin Park getting a new vocalist, and then, oh, maybe there's some bad stuff with that vocalist. Okay, maybe it's okay now. Yeah, and the the difficulty of not letting that deflate excitement or make you feel defensive about being excited in future. Yeah. Um. So yeah, go find those Laura K Buzz. You'll find all the things I do. Um. What about you, Arevia? Where are you on the internet, and what are you up to? Uh, right now you can find me under the name Arevia everywhere online, except for TikTok because somebody stole my name. And there you find me under Arevia Gaming. At the moment, I'm playing Out of the Wilds. So as I said, I will like the day after this episode comes out, I will test it again. And also remember, every Wednesday I still do the first part of the accessibility document I'm writing every Wednesday on Twitch. It will be soon be live. So that means that I am, uh, yeah, you can start learning more about accessibility. Accessibility 101 will soon be free for you to download. Uh, and you can put a tip in if you want, but it will be free. And it will be like an easy resource for you to learn more about accessibility uh, and good examples on why we do things and why we don't do things. And yeah, uh, I can't wait until that is out. I'm also going to uh, have a talk at Gamescom this year. Uh, yeah. No, that's Gamescom. GACOM. <laughs> yeah. GACOM. It's late, okay. <laughs> GACOM. Uh, so I'm working on that one, getting everything filmed and set up and ready. And I'm really nervous for that one, as I always am. But I'm also it's really It's going to be fantastic. To You're yeah. going to do great. I can't wait. <laughs> so I'm writing that one and yeah, doing a lot of those fun work so keep your eyes out if you want to learn more about accessibility from a like more document and download it and read it in your time keep your eyes out and you will see it soon wonderful thank you so much everyone for checking out another episode we'll be back in two weeks yep. with another one thank yep. you very much bye, bye.